Welcome everyone on behalf of Holocaust LA. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I'm an educator at the museum and we are pleased to welcome you this afternoon for our Veterans Commemoration Program with Don Greenbaum. Before we begin, I would like to share a few words about the museum. Holocaust Museum LA was founded in the early 1960s by a group of Holocaust survivors who wanted to make sure that people would remember and learn from this tragic history. In the early 1960s, the Holocaust was a very recent memory that was less than 20 years old. At this time, many survivors were not yet willing to relive their trauma and the public, unfortunately, was by and large not yet ready to hear from them about it. Thanks to the courage and foresight of the survivors who founded our museum, they built what became the first and oldest Holocaust survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States with the mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. While the Holocaust is still recent memory, we fulfill this mission on a daily basis, providing students and adults with the opportunity listen to Holocaust survivor testimonies and tour our galleries in person and virtually. Today, it is my honor and privilege to welcome and introduce Don Greenbaum, a world veteran and liberator of Dachau concentration camp. Born and raised in the Philadelphia area, Don's four grandparents were European Jewish immigrants. You will learn his story this afternoon and afterwards we'll have the opportunity to ask him questions. Those watching on Zoom can use the Q&A box and those watching on can use the section and we'll answer as many questions as possible. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and for sharing your story with us. It is truly an honor to have you participate in today's program as our guest. Thank you so much and you may begin. Good afternoon, Don Greenbaum. Happy to make this presentation this afternoon. Monday uh, was 77 years ago, November 9th, 1944. I was wounded in Germany. And I'm happy to say I'm alive now. And I feel pretty good. Had a good round of golf yesterday. So I'll go on. Don't visualize me as 96 years old senior citizen, visualized me as an 18-year-old kid graduating high school and two weeks later being sworn in to the United States Army. June 20th, 1943, I took the oath of office to defend my country. I was assigned to a artillery company, the 283rd Field Artillery Battalion, which is our 104 Howitzer Division. Training started in Fort Rucker, Alabama, in soaring heat. From there, we trained in Kansas City, Fort Riley, and then eventually to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where I was trained to be a radio technician and a forward observer for a 105 Howitzer Division. We then went to England. We shipped out of South Wales, and we landed in Utah Beach a couple of weeks after the invasion. We were in combat for 283 days. And the reason for that being a 105 piece of howitzer could be uh, attached to a truck and moved along on an hour's notice. So we served under many generals and different armies. We went on to uh, combat from Utah Beach, and our if we went through Holland, Belgium, uh, Luxembourg, up to the Siegfried Line. I would say we'd do 10, 20 miles a day in the beginning, as we got closer to the Siegfried Line, which was Germany's main defense line, we're now doing one or two miles a day, if we were lucky. We went through, as I said, Holland, France, Belgium, and Luxembourg. 
Our objective eventually was to go into Munich. And on the way to Munich, we were to stop at a little supply depot, which supplied the German army with arms, ammunition, and fuel for their tanks to capture and destroy it and go to Munich. We were about two miles outside of a town called Dachau. And we came across this violent odor. We had no idea what it was. We were told the Germans were not using poison gas, but we sure thought they were. The sky was black as can be. You couldn't even see the sky. As we got closer and closer to the odor, we discovered the boxcars, 15 boxcars full of dead bodies thrown in like pieces of wood. Now we know where the odor came from. As we entered the camp, first of all, we never heard the expression concentration camp or death camp. This was all new to us. And at the camp with no resistance, marched right in. And then we saw behind barbed wire, these men weighing 85 to 90 pounds in pajama type uniforms, screaming in every language you can imagine. We didn't know them. We didn't know them. They didn't know us. Luckily, one of our men spoke Yiddish. And... Uh, which is close to Polish. And we told them who we were, what we were doing there, and we're, they were free. They started to leave the camp. We said, wait, where are you going? Well, you need food, you need, you need blankets, you need kind of clothing. We brought them back into the camp and we fed them. Prior to that, on November 9th, 1944, I was wounded in Aachen, Germany, and I was awarded, I'll show it to, am I losing you? I was awarded the Purple Heart at that particular time. So sorry to interject, I think your hand is covering the camera of the, uh, the... Oh, oh, there you are, okay. I never knew that, how about that? I, I was awarded the Purple Heart, every man or woman, who was wounded or killed in combat is awarded the Purple Heart. I was also awarded the Croix de Guerre, which is the French's highest honor they could possibly give. So the two honors. Thank you for watching that. Well, we liberated this camp at 32,000, and we only saw the men. We never got the chance to see the women and children, uh, but life, life went on and uh, May 8th, the war was over and we were on our way home. It took six months for me to get back to the U good old USA. 50 years went by and uh, not much was spoken about the Holocaust at that particular time. And uh, I heard on 2020, people said the Holocaust never happened. It was all fake. It was all Hollywood. And I started to speak to a couple of groups here and there throughout the years. And then 13 years ago, uh, my wife wrote a, a, a letter uh, to the Jewish exponent which is a local Jewish newspaper explaining, explaining that I was a liberator of the camp, earned a Purple Heart, and was the artillery forward observer. About a week later, I got a phone call from a fellow who told me there's a member in his congregation who was a survivor of the camp, wanted to meet me and thank me for saving his life. Well, I called this Ernie, jo Ernie Jones, Ernie Gross. I'll get back to that later. Ernie Gross, we spoke, had lunch. We gave a lot of hugs and kisses. We've been speaking about the Holocaust for the last 13 years. To go back, after I got out, uh, Shelly, my wife and I were invited 
to a birthday party in the Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And on the way, I said to her, who is sponsoring this party for our friend? And she said, a fellow named, what was that guy's name? You didn't mention Battle of the Bulge. Uh, I'm sorry. Jerry, uh, my my wife said, yeah. Uh, uh, she told me I, I missed something. Let me go back. All right, I'm sorry. On our way, in our way in Germany on November 9th, I was wounded, as I mentioned, and I was sent to a field hospital where I recuperated for about a month. And I was sent to Paris for R&R &R to be able to enjoy myself. I was there about three days. We got a call. Anyone who could carry a gun, call back to your outfit, rejoin your company immediately. It was a 60 mile, 60 mile front, the German front. And we heard there were uh, coming into a counterattack, tremendous counterattack. And every man that could walk and talk and carry a gun was sent back in. That was called the Battle of the Bulge. Now that started December 15th, ended January 16th. Luckily, we held up. If the Germans had penetrated that line, we'd have been in really trouble. So now I'll go on to the story of Ernie Gross. When I got to the party, I said to the host, who is sponsoring uh, this, this great party? He said, well, Ernie Gross. So I said to the host, did you have any relatives in World War II named Cindy Geller? He said, oh yeah, my uncle Cindy. I said, so I was with your uncle when he was killed. They wanted to know all about their uncle Cindy. And I told them the story and it was, it was a really nice reunion. Two, two years later, my wife was very active in a, a uh, child care foundation called Terry Lynn Child Care Foundation. I was helping her check in teachers. It was a teacher honor award night. And this guy had on his lapel the same, you know, the same name as, as the other guy I spoke to. Well, another cousin. And that's what happened. And that's why Shelly wrote the article about me. Called a soldier's redemption. Called a soldier's redemption. And that's how I got to meet Ernie to the note, to the letter that my wife had written into the Jewish exponent. Well, as I said, life went on 50 years, 75 years, and uh, I met Ernie Gross that way. Unfortunately, Ernie is in rehab right now, and can I give his presentation, which is exactly what he went through, which was horrible. He was 15 years old, ended up in a concentration camp. So my story is kind of brief, uh, two and a half years worth. It was the highlights of my career in the Army. I'm happy I can be around to tell my story, which I still do. I just ended up speaking to a high school in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, to 500 students to tell my student story. Well, I'm open for questions, and I'll do the best I can to answer them. I give you a pretty short report as to my army life at that particular time concerning the Holocaust. Now, when I get through speaking, what I do is I say to the kids, go back tonight and tell your parents what you heard today from my story. And if you're a parent, go home tonight and tell your children what you heard. And we spread the word because in 10 years, or less, there'll be no one left to tell the story, and the deniers are going to say it never happened, and we can't let that happen to, to the history of the Holocaust. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for sharing with us this afternoon. Um, we do have some questions. But before we do that, um, I wanted to 
going to ask a couple of questions to begin with. So your grandparents, all European Jewish immigrants, um, did you know your grandparents growing up? Uh, yes, I did. I was very lucky. Uh, I knew all four of them, yes. When you were in Dachau or abroad in, in Europe um, in your service, do you remember th um, thinking about either your grandparents or their family members and wondering um, who they might have left behind in Europe before coming here? No, not really. Uh, my dad was a World War I. He was a mechanic in the Air Force. And my mother uh, was at the Red Cross. She drove an ambulance locally. Uh, they were both very active. Uh, my older brother was sent to the other end of the world. Uh, and my sister uh, passed away a couple of years ago. But we were a very tight-knit family. And that's, that, no, uh, my parents didn't talk much about the war. When I left and my brother left, I'm sure they uh, were kind of concerned what was going to happen to us. I corresponded with my brother periodically and got his idea of what was happening in the South Pacific. Thank you for sharing. Do you remember when you, um, you were drafted, when you entered the service, what, do you remember what was going through your mind and did your parents express con concern or what, do you remember what that was like to, um, to first be drafted and to leave your parents and to leave a home for the first time? Well, I, I had the privilege of uh, going to military school. So when I was drafted into the army and sworn in, I had already learned how to clean my rifle, how to use my rifle, and how to march and become a soldier. And my brother didn't have that experience. But my parents, having gone through World War I, had a pretty good idea of what maybe I would face eventually. Did you experience anti-Semitism in the U.S. Army? You know, it's funny. I, I only had one instance, and it was taken care of uh, right away. Uh, somebody had called a friend of mine, a, a dirty Jew. Now, let's go back. I was 18 years old, and I uh, approached this, this guy and with my revolver, and I threatened him which I shouldn't have done. And he apologized to my friend. Otherwise I had no exposure at all to anti-Semitism because no one knew who was what. We were in combat. One purpose was to defeat Germany. Sharing. Can you please describe the first moments of entering Dachau? Had the guards, um, did they totally abandon the camp by the time you were there? Um, and do, do you remember um, your first impressions of being there and seeing the prisoners? Well, when I entered the camp, it was quiet. There was no resistance whatsoever. The guards all threw their garbage down and left and some of them tried to mix in with the survivors, and they were recognized and beaten to death by the survivors. The first thing I saw, of course, was the barbed wire fence with men clawing at, at, at and screaming and yelling in all different languages. That'll never leave me. that somebody who you were with spoke Yiddish. Um, did you speak any Yiddish? No. No. My, my parents did when they wanted to talk to each other and not tell the kids what they were talking about. Do you remember the person you were with who spoke Yiddish? Was he um, born in the United States, but he was, spoke it fluently and was able to communicate with the prisoners? 
Yes, yes, he could. Are there any specific things you remember the translator um, talking about or telling the rest of you that that the prisoners had been or uh, had been saying? Well, we we saw the barracks. We saw how they they slept one on top of the other on a board. Uh, the rashes were were nil, of course. They were they were starving. Uh, we we did we. Didn't, we didn't talk to any of them. We just communicated with the one guy uh, to to bring food up for the survivors and blankets. You know, it was June, but it was nice. You know, it, it was it was May 29th, and uh, the weather was nice. But we did communicate with the survivors, or with the one guy who spoke Yiddish. Thank you. And you mentioned that there wasn't any resistance. Um, was that in response to the prisoners or some of the guards who were there? Uh, the, about to take prisoners. the guards, you know, we, we were told not to take any prisoners that particular time, but th they all fled. You know, they all went out the back. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't capture any at that particular time. If we would have, we'd have killed them. At that at that time, there were a lot of prisoners taken eventually, uh, the Germans. But I was never assigned to that, you know, that part to guard them. You know, at what point the newly freed prisoners knew who you were as the United States military. Um, do you know, did they know because the translator told them, or do you know if they could sense it from um, anything else? Well, they simply told, uh, first of all, we told them what we found. So the troops that came in had translators with them, which was a good idea, of course. And uh, they were explained that they were free. They could leave, but we recommended they did leave because they had nowhere to go. So they had to wait. And then when the backup came, the ones who were really very sick were sent to a field hospital immediately. Uh, Ernie was one of them who was a sick guy with 85 pounds, and he was sent to a sanitarium. And eventually he was sent back to the, the army headquarters. Did your you know that the prisoners, um, most of the prisoners you had encountered in Dachau were um, were almost entirely Jewish? And do you know remember at what point you figured that out? And you also at what point you realized why they were? Jewish? That we didn't know who they were. They were, uh, they were political prisoners there. Uh, they were they were gypsies. They're also. It wasn't 100 percent Jewish. Uh, there were 32,000 survivors in that camp. Not the, the ones that I know about. I don't know how many women and children were also involved. So you had a Yiddish translator um, right. with you. Do you remember? Did anybody else speak other languages um, that you were able to communicate with the non-Jewish prisoners? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. We we were there one day, one night, and then we went on, and the the, the backup troops who were prepared for this they took over. So you were only there, you said, for one day and one night. Right, that's all. And yeah. You were, and you, your unit was the first one to get there, and then there was another unit that came after to provide medical attention. Oh yes, definitely. There, there were there were three three armies that penetrated the camp from many many exits. We happened to be the one that went in the front door. This was a, a labor camp and a death camp. We happened to come up on the death camp, which consisted of the crematoriums and the gas chambers.
So once you left Dachau, um, do you remember encountering German civilians? And if so, what that experience was like? Um, you Did you or anyone in your unit communicate with them? Eventually, we did have, we were there. They marched the, the people from Dachau through the camp and the videos show that they were made to carry the, the corpses to the crematorium. They were told to walk through the camp and they showed remorse. The women cried, the men would look at it, so on and so forth. They put on a pretty good show in my estimation. What do you know about the German government acknowledging um, the crimes of Nazi Germany, whether how fast acknowledged them or um, in that process? Well, obviously it didn't help because anti-Semitism today is as bad as it was then. Here we are 78 years later, anti-Semitism is still in their head again, and we just can't imagine where all that hate is coming from. So as far as the German government was concerned, uh, they didn't do a very good job. Tell them that you went to Munich and how. Hmm? Went to Munich and how part of it was. Part of the, part of the documentary. So how long afterward did you stay um, in Germany? Well, obviously, it took about six months to get back. Uh, I was fortunate in one area and not in the other. I had a relapse. It was sent to a hospital in Reims, France, and I had received a uh, appointment to West Point. And they found me and they flew me back to Cornell University where I took the exams and I stammered horribly from my childhood, which came back to me when I was wounded. So I passed the physical and I flunked the oral part of West Point and never did become a cadet. But I did spend some time there as a, a, a backup faculty member for a while, ended up at a hospital in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Post-traumatic stress. What? Post-traumatic stress. Yeah. I had that post, you know, with the PST orders, I had that. Post-traumatic stress. So this was something that um, quite a few people would, were asking about. So you, uh, what was the process of um, PTSD and coming home? Do you remember talking about this with, with anybody at home after you were um, done and when you, uh, did, and talking about what you saw? Not until the, the guys on 2020 said it never happened. You know, I had my whole life ahead of me, college, marriage, children, never looked back at that particular time. So I'll make up for it now, but Ernie and I are speaking all over the country. You went to Germany. We were sent back to Dachau and we were very disappointed. They took down the barbed wire. They took down the towers. Uh, it was like a playground. It looked like Central Park. There was one portion there where uh, we prayed to those who we lost, but uh, it really left a, a very, very bad taste in our mouth. Now, Birkenau and Auschwitz, they have the museum with the eyeglasses and the suitcases and the clothing of those who were slaughtered. But Dachau has no really impression on people 
to know what actually happened there. So you spent about six months in Stirrup after you were in Dachau. Um, so, so you came back to the United States towards the end of 1945? Yes, yes. What are some other things you remember about the t being in Europe after the war ended there, after May of 1945, for the next couple of months? What, what were you doing during those months? Well, if, 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 you mean while I was still in the army? Yes, when you were still in the army um, for the rest of 1945, when you were still in Europe. Right. Well, uh, we, we had a, most of the guys, they had a march back. Luckily, I was flown back to Cornell University since I was assigned that uh, luckily, I could, unluckily, I could take advantage of West Point. I had a great future, I'm sure. But we got out of the army, and all you think about is, you know, the GI Bill, take advantage of that, enrolling in a college, seeing different colleges. You know, you have a choice almost at that particular time. And it took six months for us to go through all the paperwork and to get back into the United States. I think the shocking part was when I left, when I left for the army, my, my kid sister was 15, a little girl. When I came back, she was a woman, 18. That was one of the biggest things that stuck in my mind in those three years, how she grew up and became a woman. And my brother, of course, uh, he passed away at 94. Thank you for sharing. Going back to uh, in Dachau, you mentioned earlier that you did not see women and children when you were there. No, we did not. Do you know, uh, were they in a different part of the camp? They yes. There, yes. Yeah, we were told later they were. The, the, the camp was enormous. You go on Google and you see what the, what the camp looked like. Just unbelievable. But the, it was a polit it was initially erected for political prisoners. And then it became larger and larger. And then they decided to make it a death camp. It was big. Now see, Ernie, in Ernie's speech, the survivor, he saw the women. And he was talking about they had their heads shaved so he didn't know a man from a woman, even though they were separated in two parts of the camp. That was an interesting part that no one knew who, who was who at that time. You had no identification except the number on your arm if you were in Auschwitz long enough. Thank you for sure. Did you mentioned your PTSD? Do you think this was mo more from seeing Dachau or just from uh, being? in the war in general? I think it was just the war in general, but it really hit a, uh, I guess, the, the real time was in Sydney's bodies and seeing the crematorium. I said, how can human beings do this to human beings? Uh, the people in the town say they didn't know. You know, when you break a box car with hundreds of people and it goes out empty, you know something's happening in there. And it's sort of a related question. I know this is a little personal, but did this ever make you question your faith or change your outlook on religion? Yes, it has. I, I do say my prayers every night, speaking to somebody, man, woman, or whatever, don't know what it is, but I, I still reflect. And uh, I, I, you know, I try not to hold, what I do, what my whole, for, I know the German people, all right? These kids who I see now, I hear their guttural language. I can't blame them for what their grandparents did. 
we did a, a documentary for History Channel in my apartment. And the photographer told us my parents were Nazis. And my wife said they were Nazis. And here, this young kids in my house viewing my, my life. And the background was his parents were Nazis. It was just unbelievable. You remember, you remember at what point you learned Holocaust about the genocide, the genocidal aspect of World War II? Yeah, what, what's your question? At what point you realized that um, Nazi Germany had attempted a genocide of the Jewish people, um, specifically, um, and that these weren't necessarily just political prisoners, but that the people who you saw were um, imprisoned just for the reason that they were Jewish? Well, what, what always confused me was that the final solution was drawn up by educated men, lawyers, doctors, political men, and they sat around a table and discussed how to eliminate an entire generation. It, and the German people are supposed to be very clever, educated. Uh, they gave us great musicians, gave us great authors, and they just sat there and figured, all right, let's take Czechoslovakia first, we'll clean that out. Then we'll go into Poland and we'll take those Jews and we'll clean them out. And eventually we'll get rid of all the Jewish people. And then things will be back to normal again. I mean, it's just mind boggling to me that we met a woman who wrote eight books and she went to her, her uh, a Gentile woman, she went to her high school uh, teacher and said, tell me about the Holocaust. Well, we don't talk about that. They don't even, they even mention it. Then she went to her college professor, asked the same question. Tell me about the Holocaust. Her asked these questions, her husband divorced her. And she went on to write eight books about the Holocaust. She lived on the same street as he The was. same street as the final solution was drawn up. They don't want to talk about it. And to this day, 78 years later, they don't want to talk about it. And yet, look at Charleston. Jews will never replace us. What kind of talk is that? Replace you for what? And we just can't understand. The rabbis, I'm sure, can't figure out, I can't figure out how people could hate people like that for no reason. Uh, one experience I had, and it's very personal, but I'll bring it up anyway. I was dating a, a Gentile girl and her sister married a Protestant and her parents wouldn't talk to them and they disowned her because they were Catholic and he was Protestant. And I'm dating this girl for about six, eight months and they loved me. The mother was kissing me good night. The father was getting a, a, a little drunk at night, enjoying ourselves. And when I come in and she's crying, she says, I can't see you anymore. I said, why? Because I told my parents that you were Jewish. They forbid me to ever see you again. I said, they love me Tuesday and hate me on Wednesday. So that's the way it goes, I guess. Half the people who hate Jews never even met a Jew. Thank you for sharing that, for um, emphasizing that last point. You know, we talk about the Holocaust. When we teach students, we actually mention the fact that um, Jews made up less than 1% of the German population, and therefore Germans who went along with this had most likely never met a Jewish person. And so this does show the dangers of unchecked we, bigotry. We're we 2% now, the entire world. 2%, and that, that, the hatred will never go away. Thank you. Um, when, before you were drafted, do you remember what your knowledge was like on not Germany, um, you know, before the United States entered the war? Do you remember knowing about the persecution of Jews and other minorities in Nazi Germany? No, not at all. 
not at all. So you it's, learned about it pretty much I when you were it. in the service. No one knew about it. You know, the other camps were liberated prior to Dachau, but there was no communication, no internet to, to camp to camp at that time. So when we entered the camp, we expected resistance. We were ready for a war. We walk in like it was Central Park. There was no one there. Then we came across the barbed wire and the gas chambers. Then we knew about the Holocaust. Never even knew the. I never even knew the word Holocaust at that particular time. At eighteen years old. Remember the first time you did hear the word Holocaust? Well, the, the I, I guess uh, when I came home and they gave it a name, you know, all we knew was uh, crematorium and gas chambers. Thank you. And um, just to let our audience know, um, Don lives in Pennsylvania right now and just outside of Philadelphia. Um, is there a veterans group that you belong to there or a Jewish war veterans group or any sort of veterans association that you belong to? You know, no, I don't. You know, I came out of the army, went to college, got married, had children, and life went on. And I never really joined in the organization in particular. No. Uh, there's a local one here, the Jewish war veterans. Uh, I should really get involved, even at my age, but I, I don't drive that far anymore to go to their meetings. Uh, no, I never really got involved. I'd like to um, ask you about what, what you just said, that life just went on. So when you came home, um, and you mentioned already that you didn't really talk about it until you saw a piece on a Holocaust denial on the news. So do you remember what it felt like the first time you really relived these memories? I, I just I just couldn't believe it, and I, I, I didn't know who to talk to about it, uh, because there was no, you know, you talk to your rabbi, you talk to your priest, and they don't have an answer. It's out of our hands. It's in God's hands. There's no explanation how the hatred can be so strong and last so long. It's just my it's mind boggling. Tell the story of Ernie. One man said, I don't believe in you. Ernie, Ernie Gross is the survivor, tells a story walking with two other men. And one man said, If I ever get out of here, I will go and I will pray every day and thank God for the for making me free like this. And the other man said, I'll never I'll never think of God, There's never no believe point. in God. I lost my, my daughter and my wife, and he wasn't there to protect them. So how can I actually pray to someone who wasn't there for me? He said, there's no God in this place. No God in this place. He said, there's no God in this place. He said, the Germans decide who shall live and who shall die. With a wave of a hand, you were sent to a death camp or to a labor camp. And that's who God was at that time. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and it's important to show that people did have different perspectives on this um, before, during, and after. And that is important. So thank you so much for sharing. Were your grandparents still living by the time you uh, came home from service? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, my 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 parents, not my grandparents. My grandparents, oh. no, no. My parents, no. My grandparents had passed. Uh, Nineteen forty-four. I lost my, a lot of my parents. No, they were not alive. I misunderstood your question. It's okay. And by the time you started speaking about this, I don't know offhand what year this was, but were your parents still living at that time? No, no. I started speaking about it a lot when I met Ernie 13 years ago. 
because we because my speech I introduced Ernie because he has a fabulous fabulous history. In fact, his son was just on with me an hour ago for a school in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. I gave my presentation, and Jerry Gross, Ernie's son, gave his. So you've only really been sharing this story for the last um, the last thirteen years or so. Um, yeah, yeah, but people, you know, people even want to hear about it. Yeah, the, oh, that's a shame that happened. We lost six million Jews and six million gypsies, and the Germans killed twelve million people. It, it's history. It's going, you know. I spoke at a, a predominant high school to the graduating class two years ago. And I said to them, who was Eisenhower? Not one person knew who Eisenhower was. Now, this is a graduating class of a top high school in Philadelphia. They teach Lincoln. They teach Washington. They don't teach Eisenhower. I go figure that one out. Luckily, there are about 26 states right now who are mandatory to speak to teach the Holocaust. And they're adding one every day. Thank you for sharing. Do you think that this affected you specifically being a Jewish soldier instead of, um, you know, the for, as opposed to the rest of your unit um, who might have come from other backgrounds? Not really, no, uh, because we, did, we didn't know what was happening at that particular time, and they didn't either. And we were, you know, when you're in combat, you're, you're, you're brother and brother. Luckily, with the artillery, we were behind the front lines. Only I was in front because I was a forward observer. I'm, uh, I'm losing my back. Are you yeah. on? Oh, um, it looks like you um, you accidentally turned your video off. Do you see the, the um, if you- turn the No, it's a, it's a low battery. Oh, okay. But, but, um, but, but, there. Uh, okay. but I think, my, I think my, my wife has it on her iPad. There it is. Okay, well, I think it's where it looks like the charger might have fallen out. That could um, be. So um, we have one another comment here from Ben Lesser, who you have met before. And oh, he's, sure. Ben Lesser is a Holocaust survivor in our community who speaks and shares his story uh, with us and other organizations as well. And Ben says, you liberated me. I was in the 15 car death train, which you mentioned earlier. Today, I am the only survivor left out of the 6,000 from Buchenwald to Dachau. It's nice seeing you again. How about that? That's great. Hey, Thank ben. you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ben, for sharing this. And of yeah. course, Ben, we're so happy to have you in our community as well. So thank you. Um, and I, um, we're... We also like to know one last question. Are your talks, when you speak at schools, do you know how they're, can you get a sense of how the students feel after hearing them? Good question. When we speak to Hillel, which is the Jewish organization, very active, and we give our talk, the kids get up and leave. We spoke to 500 Catholic girls at a Catholic high school here. Let me tell you, you can hear a pin drop. Not one kid left. They stood in line to ask to ask to shake my hand and to give a hug to Ernie and myself. Questions were great. So therefore, we aim most of our time to the Christian world, because the Jewish world hears about it from their parents, perhaps, if the parents want to talk about it. And the Christian world, the parents never does never discuss it with their children you know, why would they it's not their history so we're so thankful when these cat when these christian people want to hear our talk we spoke to so many catholic churches we couldn't wait to speak to more of them because they're fantastic listeners 
and their questions are good, and they're shocked to hear this because their parents would never discuss the Holocaust with them. It's not their history. So we get the greatest thrill out of going to a church or a high school and telling our story. Uh, we were really charged up over it. I could talk to these kids for hours, and they'll listen. You won't hear a pin drop. So that's the difference between talking to a Jewish group and a Gentile group. Thank you so much um, for sharing that. Now, um, we would love to introduce your wife. I know she's uh, sitting next to you. If she's there, we'd love to introduce her. Oh, uh, Shelly? Shelly? Oh, looks like she Wait, stepped up a second. She'll, well, um, we're so. Yeah, oh. yeah. They, they want to meet you. <laughs> we would love yeah. to introduce you. Here I am. No Thank makeup, you. very natural. <laughs> Listening to all of it and uh, loved your questions. And hi, Ben. <laughs> and Gail. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for being with us, both, both of you. And um, it's it's really wonderful to have you speaking today, and we're so honored. Everybody is so honored to um, have been able to listen to your story. Um, one question for well, we, a question for for both of you, um, for Shelley. How did you react to learning about Don's experiences? I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I I really feel I feel oh. that Shelly, I'm I'm really sorry to interject. Um, I think we're getting okay. feedback from your iPad. If you're able I to turn it off. Okay, great. I I feel that um, it changed Don's perspective on life. He doesn't really sweat the small stuff. He takes things very uh, in his stride, and. Um, he he's a wonderful, amazing person. I have to tell you that he's a 96 year old with a forever young attitude about life. Thank you so much for sharing. And would you like to share with the audience how you met? A blind date. <laughs> My sister. Thank you so much, both of you, for being with us um, this morning, uh, afternoon, sorry, for being with us this afternoon and for sharing this story. And I speak on behalf of our whole community when I say thank you so much for everything that you did for our world. And of course, for sharing it with us again today. We wish you a happy Veterans Day and um, we are so happy to have you in our community, even though you live in Pennsylvania. We're happy to have you with I hope to meet you in person sometime. We would love to welcome you to Los Angeles. I love Los Angeles. I love Los Angeles. Great. Your, your questions were fantastic. And your work that you do is wonderful. We need people like you. You drew, you drew me out good. I love your questions. I'm going to go on for a long time. Well, thank you so much. And quite a few of those questions came from our audience who was watching today. And again, I want to remind everyone that we recorded this program and it will be available much later again for those who might have missed it or those who want to share with somebody. Um, again, we thank you so much for everything that you do for that you've done for our world and that you for us this <laughs> afternoon by sharing and for still for our community. If you're interested, the speech I gave earlier. They had like a 10 minute video, which fantastic showed it. It showed the, uh, it showed the box cars. It showed the tax going in, uh, it was an interview I gave at a college. And I don't know if you'd be interested in contacting that person or not, if you want the video. Okay, thank we you very are, much. Yeah, well, we can, thank you, I'll, I'll send you an email. We thank you so much everybody for listening, for your attention. Thank you so much, Don and Shelley, both of you. Um, and we wish every 
happy, healthy, and safe weekend and happy Veterans Day. We're thinking of our veterans today. So we thank you. Thanks, very for, much. thanks for the privilege to tell my story again to a, a nice audience. It's an absolute honor. Thank you so much. Great. Enjoy it. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. You and you as well.